Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the Semiconductor Research Corporation for hosting such a great event. And thank you to our speakers and panelists for not only joining us, but also for their stellar work in semiconductor and microelectronics research. We're here today to talk about the future of computing technologies. The SRC has a number of excellent programs working with different funding agencies towards a variety of early stage research goals in this space. And among the most successful and esteemed is the Nanoelectronic Computing Research Program, or NCORE. There are two recent broad efforts which will help usher in this new generation of advanced, sometimes called more than more devices. The first is the SRC Decadal Plan, which sets five technological seismic shifts that may help serve as moonshots in a sense, coalescing industry and research towards common high impact goals. These will help determine the long-term destination of this early stage research. The second, of course, is the passage of the 2022 Chips and Science Act, and in particular, the National Semiconductor Technology Center and the National Advanced Packaging Manufacturing Program. These efforts will be instrumental in technology transfer, scale up, and general lab to fab transition efforts. They will help serve as the vehicle through which early stage research can achieve these overarching goals established within the SRC decadal plan. It's hard to think of a more exciting time to be in this industry, as we will see unprecedented success in turning novel devices into impactful technologies and consumer products. NCORE represents one of the most important efforts for earlier stage research, and I for one am very excited to see a discussion of their success stories today. With that, please allow me to introduce our moderator and host, Steve Kramer, who serves as the University Research Manager for Micron in their Technology Development Group, and who will introduce the rest of our speakers. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Thanks, everybody. Should I uh, introduce the speakers now or wait till after Stacy? Right, I'll go ahead and introduce the, the speakers right now. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, David, uh, will be uh, Stacy Bentz. Uh, she is a uh, uh, professor of uh, chemical engineering at Stanford University, and uh, she will be speaking about uh, uh, ALD research and materials uh, deposition research for advanced semiconductors. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll be followed up by our panelists. Uh, the first panelist speaker will be uh, David Goodlack. Uh, of uh, NIST. Uh, he is the chief of the nanoscale device characterization, characterization division of the Physical Measurement Laboratory, also known as PML. Uh, we also have Jorg Appenzeller, who's from Purdue University, and uh, he uh, works on 2D materials. Uh, we also have Blanca Magari Cope, and uh, she is part of TSMC, and she has extensive. Uh, uh, background in uh, materials modeling. So that will be uh, the focus of, of her talk. Uh, then we have Jean Ping Wong, uh, who is uh, with the University of Minnesota and is a uh, foremost expert in uh, spintronic materials and uh, devices. Uh, we also have uh, Judy Cha. Uh, she is to, uh, at Cornell in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and uh, she works on uh, uh, new types of uh, uh, advanced materials uh, with topological uh, phenomena. And uh, I think that's, uh, I think I got them all. All right, so we can start with uh, Stacy. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the uh, work going on in atomic layer deposition that's driving uh, the ability to make future semiconductor materials um, through various and devices through new processes. Um, just to, to sort of start off the, this discussion, we're going to be followed by a, a panel with lots of um, really great insight into some of the new materials and device structures coming on. But we're uh, we're really facing a lot of challenges, and um, as we move toward ubiquitous uh, computing, and if you think about it from a materials point of view and the processing, 
we now have much more complexity that needs to be incorporated into modern devices. So the number of elements used in chips has exploded from what used to be just a handful, things like silicon or uh, aluminum or copper to more than 60 now. And in addition, the fabrication requirements are becoming increasingly complex. We need conformality, we need uniformity in the materials. We need to control edge placement error um, when we do uh, patterning. And interfaces, as we're starting to get more and more nanometer scale devices, really dominate. And this is where we need to think about what processes we use to put down the materials. I'm going to focus on atomic layer deposition, which is, is just one of them. This is a, a process that's been around for about 60 years, but has been um, becoming more and more important to microelectronics uh, fabrication over the last uh, decade or two. So it's a vapor phase technique for depositing thin films using these sequential self-limiting surface reactions. So typically two different precursors will be flowed in sequentially. Um, each one of those undergoes a self-limiting reaction so that one ALD cycle will deposit at most one atomic layer. It's, uh, it's been expanding like crazy in the, the range of materials that can be deposited by ALD. You can see by this nice uh, periodic table that comes from this very helpful website, Atomic Limits, uh, the vast uh, number of uh, materials that can be deposited. So they're elemental materials, oxides, uh, sulfides, and um, these calcogenides, of course, are of great interest for some of the 2D transition metal dichalcogenides that we may hear a little bit about during the panel. So lots of uh, different uh, materials that can be accessed by ALD, and the numbers are increasing all the time as processes are developed. The advantages of the process, I think, are fairly well known. The thickness control is exceptional because you just dial in how many cycles to get to a certain thickness. It's especially renowned and important in modern device fabrication because of its conformality. And this is an image which I think demonstrates it really nicely. It's exceptional, the conformality that one can achieve by this process of ALD. So this is just looking at a stack of alternating TiO2 and SiO2 layers in this nanoscale trench structures. And you can just see the beautiful reproducibility of the thickness as well as the conformality in, in this process. I'm going to actually focus on one type of ALD, which is uh, selective deposition. And um, you may ask, why do we need selective deposition? I think the first killer app of this technique, which people have been looking at for years, is really in microelectronics. And to, to understand where that comes from, if you think about an integrated circuit, of course, it has so many layers of deposited material, and each of those need to be aligned just right on top of the underlying uh, layers and patterns. And this is where complex fabrication is used. So conventional wafer fabrication requires many, many steps across multiple tools. So for every one of those layers in the structure that I show, there's deposition followed by lithography and etching and stripping and cleaning and then more deposition. And, and um, it's very much a top-down process where material is put down and then removed um, where, where required. This is causing challenges to future scaling. One of the big ones I already mentioned before is edge placement error. So if there's a little bit of an offset, then we can have um, yield uh, degradation because you have devices that don't work here. And it, uh, edge placement error is one of the biggest challenges in uh, fabrication today. But there are other challenges too. Uh, the cost of doing lithography, especially as we're looking at extreme ultraviolet is quite high. And then, as I mentioned, the, the numbers of materials that are being incorporated into modern devices is getting uh, larger. And some of these materials are we don't have good etch processes for. So all of the standard fabrication leads to some of these challenges. And this motivates a new approach to fabricating the different layers. And this is called bottom-up processing. In particular, this is selective deposition. So if you imagine you have your underlying pattern in one of those multiple layers in a, in a chip structure, could we deposit the material just where we want it? And we call the desired region the growth surface and the undesired region the non-growth surface. And so this is direct additive deposition of material only where desired. I want to come back to this example of um, sort of the edge uh, placement error. And one of the approaches to solve that are to use these fully self-aligned via approaches. So this is for back end of line processing. And on the left here is that example that I mentioned before. If you have a overlay error um, due to misalignment or misalignment causes this, 
then you can have uh, a line short, you can have um, other breakdown problems. So we wanna try to avoid this overlay error. So on the right is, is a process where one selective deposition step is incorporated into that to try to reduce this issue. So you have your bottom metal. And before you put down your next layer of all, this ULK, ultra low K dielectric, First, we're going to insert a step here where we do selective deposition of dielectric on dielectric. That's this DOD, where that dielectric you put down has some etch contrast relative to the ultra low K. So then you continue on the process here. And in your steps of etching and um, uh, your etching steps after, if you have a little misalignment, you're okay because you have already put in here this dielectric with etch contrast, and then you do the metal fill. So this is probably going to be among the first applications um, of selective deposition. How does one do that? Okay, I just I inserted a picture um, in, in the PowerPoint, but how does one actually do that? Some ALD processes exhibit inherent selectivity. They naturally will go down preferentially on one material over another, but those examples are not very prevalent. There are some cases where one can activate one of the materials over another, so you get preferential growth on the desired region. But by far the most common approach is to deactivate and use an inhibitor molecule, some organic molecule shown here with these circles and, and tails on them that go down preferentially on the non-growth region so that when you do deposition by ALD, it goes down on the non-blocked regions. And I wanna also mention that this requires two selective steps. So the inhibitor itself must first be selective toward certain materials over others. And then your ALD process must also be selective. So this is a doubly selective process that has to be developed. There has been a lot of work using self-assembled monolayers to achieve this. So again, this is the process. You have some pattern, you expose it to inhibitors. They naturally go down on the non-growth region. Then you do the ALD process and you get growth only on the growth regions. The, the most common type of inhibitor to date has been these self-assembled monolayers, which have head groups of the type shown here and tail groups that are good at blocking access by these ALD precursors down to the surface. This is work that was actually started uh, more than 15 years ago, and my own group got involved in it actually um, in a, um, an SRC-funded engineering research center for environmentally benign semiconductor manufacturing. So this was back in the you know, mid-2000s, and we were motivated by front end of line, so transistor gate stack. And we had this idea that if you have your um, region here where you've got your oxide sur surrounding your silicon gate region, you would want to put down your high K material like your hafnium dioxide selectively on the silicon gate region. And we would do this by, again, using inhibitors that went down on the silicon oxide selectively and then hafnium oxide deposition. But at the same time, we thought, well, there's a way potentially to do the reverse selectivity where we would preferentially block the silicon and therefore get growth only on the silicon oxide. And it turns out that that process was, um, was developed and, and does work. So here is a pattern of silicon oxide um, on, on silicon, which is terminated by hydrogen. If we do the pathway where we only block the oxide, we can do selective growth of hafnium only on the silicon regions, hafnium oxide. If we block only the silicon, then we get selective growth. In this case, we were testing it with platinum only on, on the uh, oxide regions. So we can get the positive and negative of the pattern there. Now, fast forward 15 years, and there's a lot more interest currently on looking at back end of line. So here we'd be interested, for example, in doing this dielectric on dielectric, this DOD, where we would preferentially block the metal and get growth only on the dielectric. And I'm showing an example here of SiO2, but we and other groups have also looked at doing this on low K dielectrics. So here's the kind of molecule we use as the inhibitor. It goes down preferentially on the copper, and these are the results of a process using that. So here are copper-filled trenches in SiO2, where we've first exposed it. Our first selective step is to expose it to this inhibitor. The second selective step is to do zinc oxide ALD, and you can see the zinc oxide goes down only on the SiO2. And you can see over here on the right in the elemental analysis, you only get zinc um, sitting on top of the silicon regions and not on top of the copper. 
this is starting to be explored by various companies. This is a presentation um, not quite a year ago by TSMC uh, that they presented at the uh, January IEDM meeting. Again, you could, this application might look familiar. This is for this uh, fully self-aligned VIA where they show they put down self-assemble monolayers. They do the dielectric on dielectric growth and they get really nice uh, nanoscale selective growth of the dielectric um, with the on the dielectric with the sand blocking the metal. The selectivity is a unit that we like to use a lot in, in um, trying to compare selectivities of various processes. It's effectively defined here. It's how much goes down on the desired surface versus the non-desired. And this uh, report here was uh, selectivities of uh, more than 0.9999. And one is perfect selectivity. Doesn't only work for some of those um, inorganic dielectrics. We've um, also been trying to look at uh, low K dielectric deposition. So this is an ALD process that my group developed recently to grow a silicon oxycarbide. It has a slightly lower dielectric constant in, the, in its current form. And again, we try to see if we could deposit it selectively on other dielectrics. So we'd have to block metals. So we develop chemistries, inhibitor chemistries to block the metal to get selective growth only on the dielectric. And I'll show you an example, again, just a proof of concept experiment here where we have a copper aluminum pattern. Okay, so here we effectively have two metals, although the aluminum has an aluminum oxide on it. And depending on which inhibitor we select, we can either get selective growth only on the copper, or we can get selective growth of our low K only on the aluminum. And that's shown here in this elemental detection, looking at silicon, which is present in this low K material. So again, developing chemistries to get selective growth. So one of the things that um, we are often considering is how can we expand the toolkit of of systems that we can deposit selectively. And uh, this is work that we've been um, performing under the SRC NCORE Center New Limits, where we look at um, what, what we could typically do, which I'll call kind of easy selectivity, which are these metal dielectric patterns, and ask, what if we have a more challenging system where we have two dielectrics? Those are more chemically similar, so it's harder to come up with inhibitors that will block one of those and not another. So this is one of the things we've been looking at. Again, we turn to these self-assemble monolayers and we develop um, processes for putting them down where we can tune out the selectivity where they go down preferentially on one dielectric over another. And I won't go into the details of that, but I'll just show you the, the results. So here's the type we're using and what I'm just gonna show on this slide. These are these phosphonic acid inhibitors and by changing things like the solvent or the time or the temperature, which we put them down on our, our substrates, we can get selective growth of ALD on SiO2, where we've only blocked all these metal oxides. I'll show you the results of that. So here we're getting selective growth on silicon oxide, not aluminum oxide, not titanium oxide, not tantalum oxide, shown in these images. And then by further optimizing, we can actually get selective growth on one metal oxide over another. So here we have a hafnium oxide, aluminum oxide pattern, and we can get selective growth on hafnium oxide and not aluminum oxide. And these selectivities have room for improvement. They're, they are above 95%, um, but these are processes that can still be optimized. As we develop chemistries for doing selective deposition, we also have to think about what is the process we're using to do ALD. And one of the levers we have for ALD is the ALD precursor itself. And there's a lot of room for development of new precursors, but um, we, we can take what's available and, and see what the effect is of the different precursor on selective growth. And there are lots of things one can tune about the precursor, which are listed here. I'm going to tell you about a system um, that we looked at where we take uh, aluminum oxide ALD. This is the most commonly used precursor. It's called TMA, trimethyl aluminum. And we look at, we explore substituting off some of those ligands for chlorides. And we also look at taking the methyl and making it longer as ethyl. So we're looking at a series of aluminum precursors. They all deposit aluminum oxide, but they have slightly different properties. And then we do experimental work and theoretical work to try to understand the selective growth. And again, this is work done in the uh, New Limit Center, the NCORE Center. We're showing aluminum oxide ALD 
selectivity depends strongly on what that precursor is. Okay, so again, it's all aluminum oxide ALD. Here we're plotting the selectivity growing on a silicon surface versus one that's been blocked for four different precursors. And you can see the selectivity goes down as you increase the growth thickness, but there's a lot of variation shown by color here between the different precursors. The best one here is in yellow. This is the triethyl aluminum. And the worst one is the trimethyl aluminum and the ones in between are the chlorides. And so we've done a lot of work trying to understand why, I'll just address this one question, why is TMA, trimethyl aluminum, so poor? If you look at the effective average size of all of these different precursors shown here in this table, you'll notice one is different from all the others, and that's TMA. Okay, so we believe that this smaller average size of that precursor allows it to penetrate into the inhibitor layer, the self-assemble monolayer, and give it more difficulty in blocking. If we take the better precursor, the triethyl aluminum, then we can go back and get good selectivity. So this is just, again, a test pattern, platinum pads on a silicon oxide substrate. And when we do selective ALD using this nicer, more selective precursor for aluminum oxide, we get really good selectivity just on the platinum. There's um, also interest in moving away from these longer chain inhibitors and trying to use what are called small molecule inhibitors. So these are uh, molecules that also can block the surface, but they're, they're uh, potentially easier to deliver in the vapor phase because they're more volatile and they're smaller. And there's been a lot of nice work over the last several years to develop new small molecule inhibitors. This is work out of Hanbo Ram Lee's group at Inchon University using silane-based precursors where they showed selectivity, they can block SiO2 and get growth on silicon. There's also uh, really nice work coming out of the Mockus group at Eindhoven University, developing, for example, this three-step cycle using this acetyl acetone inhibitor combined with a, a plasma-enhanced uh, ALD process for silicon oxide growth. And because this inhibitor has a preferential adsorption on some surfaces over another, as sort of demonstrated by this plot here, you can uh, get selectivity across different material systems. Our group has been looking at some of these organosilane small molecule inhibitors. So we try to understand what it is about the inhibitor that allows it to block well. Um, it turns out that these are much more challenging to get good selectivity with than the longer chain organic molecules. They're just, it's, there's not as much there to block the ALD precursors with. Um, just a summary of what we've seen when we've explored a range of these is that the reactive head group, the part that sticks to the surface, that is pretty important in how well it blocks, but surprisingly, the tail length for these small molecules didn't matter much. I'm gonna take our, one of our best inhibitors out of this category, which is this trimethoxypropyl silane. So this is a small molecule inhibitor that should go down preferentially on the oxide surface. And then we're gonna explore it with aluminum oxide selective ALD. And there's a lot on here, but if you just draw your attention to the green curve, which is the selectivity that's been extracted, you can see that for aluminum oxide ALD, it doesn't work well at all. The small molecule inhibitor really doesn't do a good job of blocking. Within a few cycles, we're down at almost no selectivity. However, we have another um, tool, which I described before, which is we can change the size of the ALD precursor. So if we try this experiment again, using triethyl aluminum, that bulkier ALD precursor. Now you can see for that same small molecule inhibitor, we can get quite good selectivity out um, to uh, more selective growth to many cycles of ALD. And this is just showing a pattern. We can block at least four nanometers of ALD um, on SiO2. Um, so we get DOD growth. Uh, sorry, uh, we get the growth on, on the copper and we block the SAO2. So this is di dielectric on metal. The last few things I uh, want to say are just, I, I want to come back to this process itself. We, we show pictures of ALD as being a pristine uh, process where we get a beautiful orderly arrangement of atoms at the surface for each cycle. But the reality is much more complex. And there's a lot of work to be done in understanding ALD at the atomic level so we can develop better processes. Again, we think about these idealized pictures where we know where every molecule goes and we get these nice conformal films 
but the reality is much more complicated. And often in the deposition, we get islands, which then nucleate, nucleate as islands and then coalesce and get, give rough films. And this is just an example of that. This is platinum ALD on um, SiO2. And you can see this is nothing like a continuous film, right? We're getting little islands that take many, many cycles, a very thick film before it coalesces. There's some really nice work um, uh, that people are starting to look at. We've done a little bit of it, trying to pre-treat the surface to get better nucleation. So here we're looking at some small molecules that would then lead to better nucleation and therefore more continuous films. This is just one result where on the left is 100 cycles of platinum ALD, where we really don't get very good coverage. But if we first pre-treat with a submonolayer of some small molecule, we can get much better coverage. So this is another important direction, I think, for the field of ALD. I want to end with just uh, the challenges. So there's still a lot to be done um, in uh, requirements for ALD for high volume manufacturing. You can see some of the things I've touched on. It's, it's great with conformality, but we need to make sure that that's controlled. The film continuity I just mentioned, Composition control as we start to move to some of these more complex materials, ternary or greater materials, how we can control the composition by ALD is going to be important. I mentioned selectivity as well. And finally, let me just acknowledge um, I've had a, one, a number of really amazing students and postdocs who've done this work over the years, starting from our first work back in the mid 2000s to today. We've had some great collaborators, um, some listed here, and we've had really great collaborations with a lot of the companies um, and funding, and we're really grateful to the SRC for funding a lot of this work. So thank you. Thank you, Stacy, for that. Um, maybe we have time for a quick question for you. Uh, before we move on, uh, some people are wondering why or what the edge roughness of your selective ALD processes look like. So if you were to look at those top down, are, are they uh, uh, very well aligned to the structures or do they have some sort of uh, roughness that's not really associated with, with uh, the structure themselves? Yeah, there's a lot of um, concern about the roughness at the sort of nanometer length scale. Um, we, we've done a little bit of work, but not down to the sort of the size scale one needs to. I think IMEX done some nice work looking at that recently, where they're getting pretty good edges on sort of 10 nanometer uh, patterns. So it, it is a um, something of concern, especially if you think about with the self-assembled monolayers, those are themselves about two nanometers in length. So that could, you can imagine that could lead to roughness on the order of sort of nanometer length scale. But so far, um, that has uh, still an open question. But the initial results uh, out of IMEC are showing that that is looking pretty good. All right. Um, yeah, they're getting pretty deep, but maybe one more here. Um, but can you comment on uh, the projected temperature range of uh, or the maximum temperature range that you believe uh, the, the SAM assisted um, selective ALD will be will have potential? Yeah, that is a very strong function of the SAM you use. So some of them, um, like the thiols on copper, they come off at relatively low temperatures by say, you know, in the 200 degrees C. Uh, some of them, like the silane head groups, they're quite stable to many hundreds of degrees C. So for those, you can do sort of most um, interesting, uh, technologically important ALD processes. And then the ones that use um, small molecules where you might redose at every cycle, then you can get away with some damage by temperature because you're going to keep reforming them. So there is a range. It is a limitation on some of the SAMs uh, for sure, but other SAMs are much more temperature stable. Well, since we do have five minutes, maybe we can uh, dig dig down just a little bit more here. Um, there was a comment on uh, whether uh, the area selective approaches uh, have a lot of problems with contamination, uh, in particular carbon, since uh, many of these SAM materials have, have carbon in them. Right. We have, uh, we've done only a little bit of work on that. So I think that's an open question about um, the, I mean, we, we don't see carbon at the level that we can detect it with our techniques, but but whether it affects the electrical properties, we, we really don't have as good of an answer on that. And I see that the other part of that question is the additional time required per cycle. That's a very important question. For some of the SAMs, it adds a lot of time. 
um, it, it depends how often you want to re redo re dose that uh, SAM. Um, for, for some of them, it's on the order of it might add a few seconds per cycle. And as we go to more toward the small molecules, those can just be dosed cyclically on the same, you know, in the same system as one is um, doing. So you have your alternating, you know, precursor for the inhibitor and then your ALD precursor. So it does add a little bit of time, uh, but uh, we're always trying to reduce that. All right, I think uh, in the, uh, since we have uh, a lot of panelists uh, to speak, um, we should probably use the time that we have now to, to move to them. Um, uh, the first person uh, we will have speak today is uh, uh, David Goodlock. And again, he's, uh, he's our panelist from NIST. Uh, the panelists will be uh, speaking um, for five minutes each, and then we'll have a round table uh, where, where I'll ask them some questions and the audience will have a chance to uh, send their Q and A's to me uh, to interject and maybe get back to Stacey Van a little bit uh, in, in there as well. Um, so please don't put your questions in the chat, put them in the Q and A and uh, I will read them to the panelists. Thanks. David. Uh, thank you, Steve. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, I'd like to thank SRC for ask, asking me to um, come and, and participate in this event today. Um, and I'm also very honored to be here with so many um, esteemed folks in research that have made so, so many significant contributions towards nanoelectronics. Um, I wanted to start off by, by just saying that um, SRC, um, that their nanoelectronics programs in my opinion, were, were really crucial in a time of uncertainty and significant consolidation. If, if we don't walk away from this panel session with, with anything else, at least from my side, I'd, I'd like to drive that point home. Note that a lot of this consolidation through industry um, over the last 20, 25 years is not necessarily because we haven't been able to aggressively, continually aggressively scale um, CMOS to through material scaling and dimensional scaling in various ways, um, that, that a lot of this is a, a lot of this consolidation is aside from that and purely economics and decisions around um, profitability of business of microelectronics business units um, to, to vertically integrated industry members and, and a variety of other reasons. So um, you know, scaled silicon CMOS continues to thrive. Um, there is a Moore's Law projection for that over the next 10 or 20 years, and there's considerable work in there in materials and dimensional scaling, um, so roles for many people to play. The, set, the second point I'd like to, to sew in is really that the NRI and NCORP programs um, have created an environment that influences research well beyond the programs that they directly fund or have funded. Um, I think that, that we are better positioned for the new Moore's Law era of 3D nanoscale devices and 3D um, integrated systems. And we're better positioned to address the needs of future industries that are underpinned by, by these 3D nanoelectronic devices and systems like quantum, advanced communications, artificial intelligence, and bio or personalized medicine. Again, all of these are underpinned not just by a sophisticated silicon or CMOS computational package, but also by a host of new materials and devices that are integrated in novel ways for computation, sensing, transduction, and transmission of information. A lot of, a lot of that promising um, space um, will, will benefit from the work that NRI and NCOR have sponsored in, in, the, in the area of new materials and devices. Um, next slide, please, Victor. So I, I thought I'd just touch on a little bit about the two programs to kind of show the, the, the breadth of materials and devices that were, that were pursued over the last 15 or so years. Um, so this is a snapshot of, of um, partnerships under the NRI in the first two five-year rounds of, of funding. And as you can see, the, the investments were predominantly around low power switches 
for beyond CMOS with considerable investments in magnetic and spin-based devices and materials, some investments in, in steep sub-threshold slopes, whether um, ferro FETs or tunnel FETs, and some early investments in, in 2D materials. Um, and we can see um, that, that while not all these investments resulted in replacement technologies for CMOS, obviously, they, that the industry more generally is better positioned. We can consider the foundational work around ferro FETs. And while not all of, of the steep subthreshold slope work was funded under the SRC, there's been um, considerable work on advanced ferroelectronics within this program. Um, with regard to tunnel FETs, several, several approaches were pursued. And this really informed us moving forward of challenges in theory around materials, band structure, how to do novel contacts, how to do vertical device um, structures with ALD on sidewalls. Um, it brought into a lot of the questions about how do we benchmark, how do we create suitable test structures, how, how do we um, define figures of merit moving forward, and all of the challenges around um, creating, in many cases, vert vertical devices, so moving into that third dimension. Um, certainly early work on 2D materials that has been greatly expanded under new limits and new limits has been just amazing in opening our eyes on all the different parts of the technology stack that can be affected by low dimensional or 2D materials. Um, cer certainly if there is a commercial computer based on stacks of 2D materials, um, to enable the, the highest possible density of transistors, it probably wouldn't exist or it won't exist without the foundational work done on 2D materials and devices from the NRI and NCORP programs. Um, and, and when we think about working with 2D materials, of course, there are lots of challenges there, both 10 and 15 years back, as well as today, that are being addressed and have to be addressed to move forward. And, and certainly there's a lot of work around um, magnetic and spin-based materials. Um, we can think of not just the goal of moving towards a low power replacement switch, but um, we can also think of the work that's come out of these programs that introduced new promising architectures for low power computing using approaches such as um, stochastic or probabilistic computing and also neuromorphic computing. We can also think of work in new quantum magnetic materials that, that have been explored and advanced, as well as lo inexpensive large area deposition methods um, developed for spin orbit materials and 2D magnets and wild metals. And all of these um, hold promise for the basis of emerging non-volatile and low energy magnetic based technologies. So I, I, I just don't think that we can really say enough about everything that's been accomplished under these programs. If you can go on to the next slide. And certainly NIST role in, in NCOR was present with the SMART and the New Limit Centers, but also there's been tremendous investment by NSF um, pursuing many different materials and technology platforms for many different types of computing. Um, I'd like to say that in addition to, to the scientific gains, it's also helped us better understand how we can leverage the national network of nanofabrication facilities within the university structure to continue to benefit advancements in advanced electronics. Next slide. Finally, I'd, I'd like to just um, end my little five minute segment with just some data. Per, perhaps one of the greatest gains beyond the, the science and promising technology is the um, workforce development. So we've done, through the NRI, through NCORE, we've done tremendous engagement with, with top tier leading universities. Um, we've had thousand, up to a thousand now particip participating students over the, the two different programs. Um, industry and, and government labs have been outstanding in sponsoring internships for students. 
We've seen hiring into all sectors, industry, academia, as well as government and national labs. And we've seen how the industry has shifted and how SRC and NCOR has responded over 15 plus years, starting initially with this subset of integrated device manufacturers that at first shrunk to the NCOR program, which is now ballooning up beyond a dozen with not just integrated device manufacturers, but also um, system man manufacturers. Um, and finally, many, many publications, um, again, the industry engagement and the intellectual property that spun out of these programs. With, with that, I, I will, um, I'll, I'll stop and I'm happy to turn the next segment over to Jörg Appenzeller. Yeah, thanks for that uh, nice overview from, from uh, David on the, the NIST and NSF and uh, the corporate sponsors uh, with the SRC programs. Thank you very much. Um, great to be here. Um, thank you, SRC, for the kind invitation, giving me a platform to highlight some of the great breakthroughs that were accomplished through the New Limit Center. And uh, um, David actually put it very nicely that um, there are a lot of opportunities in front of us. And I want to emphasize that we have reached a new stage thanks to all the investments uh, by the industry and NIST and other government agencies, where in particular when it comes to 2D materials and devices, we are ready for the next stage. And I think that um, plays well in, along the lines of what many people are talking about these days when it comes to lab to fab solutions, because we need to think in this direction, what can be done to take our research out of the prototyping chiplets and do more than what we have done in the past in order to support this effort of translational research. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so let me brag a little bit about things that have happened in New Limits. Uh, one uh, topic that we were targeting early on was two-dimensional materials uh, for interconnect applications. And the, the question there was, of course, um, what can we do in order to overcome or alleviate the bottleneck that is uh, in place due to the fact that the resistivity, not just the resistance of copper interconnects is increasing when we are scaling down VRs and interconnects. And that's a, that's a big problem, of course, because we are not just increasing, as I said, the resistance by a little bit because we are changing the area, we are increasing the resistance by a lot. And the other uh, thing that needs to be mentioned in this context is that for the VS and interconnects, we're not just talking about the copper itself. In order to build these structures, we need liners and diffusion barriers, in particular for copper, to also fit into this narrower and narrower space that is available in order to create these metal lines. And um, a very uh, nice idea that was explored in this context, next please, um, in New Limits was to use two-dimensional materials, some example given tantalum disulfide, and in this case, with tantalum disulfide, it was shown by the team that actually the adhesion properties, the diffusion properties, and the resistivity, all of which can be improved in the sense that we are using up very little space for the liners and diffusion barriers, while at the same time promoting better resistivity of the copper interconnects and vias. So this is a, a great breakthrough. And I think one of those lowest hanging fruits for the industry to jump in and carry things forward, of course, with the help of further R&D that should be going on at scale. Next slide, please. Uh, the other big opportunity that we see in two dimensional materials is for logic uh, applications. And I want to not exclude front end of line here, but the emphasis has certainly been on back end of line. And uh, what has been found is that in particular, a low temperature growth can be negatively impacting the transport properties in these two-dimensional materials. The two-dimensional materials become the channel in our transistor applications. And another problem that in general we have been facing as a community is that often there are beautiful solutions of new type of emerging transistor devices, but they are just one type, often N-type transistors, instead of really providing solutions for N-type and P-type to make CMOS become a reality. And this is where New Limits has made tremendous progress. Next slide. Thank you. Where we have shown that indeed for scale devices, I want to emphasize this because there's a lot of work on transistors out there, in particular N-type transistors, tungsten disulfide or molybdenum disulfide. We have pushed the envelope when it came to channeling scaling. 
a lot of groups have done that simultaneously with gay dielectric film scaling for both uh, materials that are suitable for NFETs and PFETs, and I believe these are record high uh, performance specs. You see the tungsten SL night PFET that we recently published is on par in terms of current drive capability at voltages, drain voltages at scale, and gate voltages at scale. So this is very important to be emphasized. Again, there's a lot of work on non-scale devices that often overlooks problems that are associated with the scaling of these devices. And you see our subthreshold slopes are decent. Threshold voltage control is getting there. So we are really moving in a direction that uh, previously was unthinkable when it comes to prototypes that are fabricated in, uh, academic, in academic institutions. Uh, last slide, please. So the last point I want to make is two-dimensional materials, not only good for interconnects and logic applications, but also memory type of applications. The verdict for novel non-volatile memories is not completely out there yet. Some companies have shown more interest, for example, in RM applications. Others have identified phase change memory as a, a better approach for these emerging non-volatile memories. And we were uh, able, next slide please, we were able to show that indeed novel types of characteristics that you have not seen in any three-dimensional material, in this case here in molybden ditelluride vertical transport through molybden ditelluride can allow for nanosecond switching speeds. And again, these are non-volatile memories operation at low voltages. One volt operation has been demonstrated with an, through an electric field induced crystal phase to crystal phase transition. Again, this is unique to these two dimensional materials and is ultra fast and very reproducible in our way. Again, an opportunity to move forward into this space. So two-dimensional materials, good for a lot of applications. A lot has been demonstrated in the New Limit Center. And with this, I want to thank you, everybody. Next slide. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Jorg, for staying on time and for that uh, great overview. Uh, next up, we have uh, Blanca magyari Cope. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the invitation also. It's my pleasure to be here to discuss about paradigms on the modeling side for the next decade. And um, you can go to the next slide, please. So um, what I wanted to highlight on, on this slide is actually um, some of the application areas and some of the previous work that um, I noticed had been done in the last few years within the NCORE and JUMP material simulation projects. So focusing on the application, going from bulk properties to surface or interfaces, the material optimization trends will be key uh, moving forward, designing new devices as, um, as we all um, tend to agree on it. So here, here I list a few areas and highlights from, um, from the Encore project, um, by no means comprehensive, but trying to show the breadth of research uh, and its rapid evolution during the past few years. Breaking it up into areas such as searching um, and engineering low K, high K materials, the top side of the figure, uh, exploring ferroelectric properties, going from the right to the left. Uh, the example for the ferroelectric part is actually a very nice one of collaboration between theory and experimental groups addressing grain formation and yeah. effect. Then searching for materials for interconnects, um, going to the resistivity, strain effects, um, they are all um, have made important contributions, both for the bulk and the contact areas, as, as well as proposing screening procedures based on multiple classification criteria. So, um, as well as including some practical um, aspects into that screening as well, moving the field further on um, along this line. As we, as we move to the left side, bottom left side, it's an example, not yet, <laughs> still on this slide. So the left side um, of, the, of this slide will um, address his more application oriented to back end of line, uh, optimization of thin film properties, um, and these areas have been getting important traction as well. Uh, our important finding that um, had been reported previously regarding the thickness dependencies and um, interlayer design and so on. And finally, another example that would be the left top 
uh, figure relates to uh, surface reactions uh, for deposition and etching modeling that can start from the atomistic understanding and build up a comprehensive understanding of how we can improve the deposition, like Stacy was mentioning about um, important questions in the ALD uh, deposition. We need to have a better understanding and therefore um, improve the precursors or the way the precursors interact with each other to be able to come up with surface treatments as possible solution. And finally, to enhance the quality of the materials that are deposited and will be used in the devices. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So moving forward on the modeling side, what do we expect and hope to happen in the next decade? The goal is to, to be able to do a full hierarchical modeling cycle, starting from fundamental materials properties, taking them to device or process level, uh, and then to system level, uh, ultimately combining all of the effects from all areas. As pointed out with the examples in the previous slides, there has been already tremendous effort and remarkable successes around along these directions by incorporation of automations um, at various levels, actually, at various levels of this um, hierarchical design, not just atomistic, um, and that speeds up the process. Um, but using high throughput techniques, for example, to for the screening side to come up with new materials, optimize the materials properties, optimize the defect uh, distributions in the materials, um, building the multi-scale schemes. Um, again, this in in the plot on the on the right side, I'm I'm showing two aspects of it: the electrical and the process, the physical. Um, on the on the left and right side. So we are looking to engineer multiple properties, uh, work functions, mobility, uh, federal electric, MTJs. Um, also a key aspect everywhere would be traps and defects. And um, on the process side, there are uh, the connections between the atomistic level to higher level. Uh, the kinetic Monte Carlo approaches, and then coming up with more continuum models. And uh, finally, um, the um, one of the newer advancements relate to incorporating machine learning models. And this can be done at several levels, um, incorporating from the atomistic level. However, um, what could be a possibly efficient scheme moving forward? is to include multiple feedbacks of um, data coming from an existing database, expand that with new atomistic models, and then um, parse it into a machine learning engine, use the prediction to perform the experimental observations, identify the potential issues, and extract the key metrics to be further improved. And then um, whether they, those would be defect related or interdiffusion or interfacial intermixing, uh, it would need to be uh, feedback into the loop to further refine the models and, and repeat this cycle for, for a smooth and um, efficient way to solve all the issues. So this is depicted on the figure on the left bottom side. Okay, so despite uh, these outstanding recent advances, how far are we uh, in building a fully functional virtual fab at the moment? Um, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done to figure out the more generally applicable schemes for most of the materials, not just for specific materials. We also need to work on polishing the bridges in the multi-scale areas to, to achieve a smooth transition between all of the layers in the hierarchy and uh, how the parameters are parsed from one level of model to the next. Methodologically, um, also work, more work will be needed to bridge between the microscopic property characterization into a more uh, macroscopic statistical approaches. So I think we are at the crossroad at this time, and it's a really exciting time in the modeling area. And we will be looking forward for several breakthroughs coming within this decade that can help us achieve this strong collaboration as well between the academic research institution and the industrial uh, groups. 
So that would be uh, my part. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Malika. Uh, next up, we have uh, another quick uh, presentation. This one's from uh, Jean-Ping Wang, and he will be talking about uh, Spintronics. Thank you, Steve. Can you hear me well? We can. OK, yeah. So uh, I'm going to uh, zoom into several examples. Start. There's a new physics and the new materials and also a new device concept uh, enable the, you know, we call the energy efficient uh, system. So that's uh, being worked out well with uh, ANCOD program, the smart center, and also collaborating with NIST collaborators. There's so many I not have a chance to mention their names. And also some of collaboration cross ANCOD to the uh, jump program like ANSAT. So I also part of that. Next slide. Yeah, so how can we address those uh, energy, you know, efficiency questions, right? So example is the human brain is uh, 10 watts and then alpha go alpha zero is, um, you know, kind of like a, a six order magnitude power consumption higher. And then that's matched with uh, SRC decadal plan in terms of how, uh, what we need addressed, right? There's a, about a six order magnitude uh, we offer using the, today's CMOS technology. Let's come to how can we do this? So the answer is you can you have to do from vertical integrated effort, and then you have to shift the focus in the way from traditional transistor thinking to a new device in terms of the functionalities. I call that primary functions. I just give you one single simple example that is uh, like a random number generator using single MTG, 10 nanometers, you can do that. But uh, as a CMOS based, you, are, you have consumed almost a thousand times high energy to do that. So that's why I call those uh, you know, scaling uh, benefit from the emerging device. Another example is a PBIT. At C spin time, that's a 2012 to 2017 Starnet program, the PBIT concept came out from the, this vertical integration effort, right? So people working on the magnetonic junction, super magnetic materials show up and uh, and then there's a system level sinking and then things boom come out another example you can show from the you know the, the left bottom side is a missile device and a comac device it's really using the new materials like topologic material at that time we push the front line front lines and then come out with the device concept by intel and by university of minnesota and a couple of other collaborators so you can see here, that's really, really very, very successful story we had before, as David also pointed out at the beginning, but this is a even big picture wise. And then if MTJ or magnetonic junction really enable not only the things I mentioned like PB stochastic computing, but also true in memory computing, that's again the functionality because of those current voltage controlled behaviors. Next slide. Uh, I pick up two uh, uh, examples. That's what uh, you know. Ankle Center, uh, the Smart Center, and then uh, Ansett Center are part of that. Also achieved. Uh, so why is uh, from physics side? You know this VCMA uh, 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 driven MTG switch is so critical, and also SOT driven uh, uh, memory or logic app is so critical. But energy consumption never get chance to further reduce, right? And in terms of order of magnitude until we really dig out the new physics as I showing here, the right to column. That we engage the new physics called voltage controlled exchange bias for soft structure, synthetic antiferromagnet structure. And then this metallic system, and then that's really this physics is new because you don't have those electron screening is the issue, right? Uh, and then you have solution now for both faster switching and the immunity for external field at the same time, order of magnitude lower in terms of energy consumptions. So that's really, really exciting achievements. So this uh, SRC support for ANCOD and also John. Next slide. Now come to the new materials. So, and then we know just like a, a qubit, right? Qubit take advantage of superconducting material like collective behaviors. That's why things work so well compared to other qubits, right? And then the spintronic actually is the same thing here, right? We have a collective behavior of electrons. That's why we work at room temperature. And also that's why energy consumption is so low. You can go to 60 kBT. 400 electron transistor, you have 16,000 kBT. 
this ideal case. But in reality, STT, MRAM, STT, you know, is all involved the device and it is still very high. But functionality positions those devices really in a good way for immediate application already there, right? There's a product already in the market. But what's the next? Through the support by SRC and also NIST and also DARPA, you can see we discovered the new topological materials. Right, we call the chiral topological materials, and then there's even more the you know screening through the topologic materials through this smart center program, and then we can see energy efficiency could be thousands times better energy daily product thousand times better compared to tungsten dichloride compared to lucidium oxide all those materials very standard material or some or even emerging material, but the, with this new material research, we can go beyond that. Next slide. Yeah, now I, I talk about the device on functionality enabled, you know, system level energy efficiency. This very good example, right? So we have a concept called computational random access memory. And then you based on the memory systems, that's a, it's a memory standard, but it just changed from one transition to two transistor, right? Now you can have a memory and the logic in the same locations using memory cell, you do the computing. So we have this idea for a while. Now through this one, you do the benchmarking and then design. You can design the spike neural network. And this is through the support also, I mentioned SRC and the DARPA. And then so you can make the things totally different. And then the right figure showing you, and then we compare to those Intel's uh, uh, Loy you know, designs and also some other designs and this uh, cram based uh, using STT or SOT, we call it SHE, uh, spin hole effect one, is 100 times low energy consumptions. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's really it's showing the functionality and that really works here, right? Next slide. My last slide just show you, you know, how can we go move forward? Right, so this we need a collaboration effort. The David York and uh, you know uh, Blanker all point that out very clearly, right? But here you have to also change from the learning we had before Bell Lab, from other centers, from SRC support or DAPA support, needs to support center. There's so many successful story, but there's certain things you had to do horizontal or vertical, right? Here I want to see you have to learn from there. Why is the co design? And the one is high throughput mature screening. You need to combine this all together, system guidance. And then good, good news is we do have those platform now. We have a certain university, 25 PIs from a consortium try to target on work this out and a wonderful proposal already is there. And then you look at the right figure, just showing how complex this situation should be. And then, but also we can address that with this kind of collective uh, uh, effort, right? For example, we're looking into the spin charge couple together and the top logic, and that means the charity you have to concede. At the same time, the platform of the materials, you have to look at, I mentioned top logic, chiral materials, 2D materials, and nitride and oxide materials, right? If you just look at one aspect of this, you may missing that the key invention of the next generation transistor, but with all those together, there is a chance we can go to that level. That's exactly SRC decadal plan, I believe, looking into. Okay, I stop here, Steve, yeah. That's great, thank you so much, uh, Jiangping. And for staying on time, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Judy Cha from Cornell University. And uh, she will be speaking about uh, topological materials. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, semiconductor industry have interconnect challenge uh, where the current copper interconnects, the reducivity of copper interconnect increases dramatically as we shrink the diameter of these interconnects. And Yuri Appenjala from U Limits also discussed his interconnect challenges and thinking about using the two dimensional materials to solve this problem. So, this incredibly high resistivity of copper at the small dimensions leads to unacceptable signal delays and dynamic power dissipation. And this problem will get, get worsened much faster as we shrink it further. Next slide. So, if you think about interconnect applications, the ideal behavior would be the one where the resistivity would decrease as we shrink the dimensions of the interconnects. And it turns out there are materials that show that behavior. Next, please. So cobalt silicide 
platinum silicide and niobium arsenide have been shown experimentally at room temperature to show decreasing resistivity with decreasing dimensions. And it turns out all these are topological semi-metals. Next, please. Uh, one more click, please. So what are topological metals or semi-metals? These are bulk metals that also have topologically protected surface states, which is denoted in this band structure with yellow color. Next, please. Um, and these topological surface states are predicted to have superb transport properties with very high electromobility and suppressed electron scattering. Next, please. And the reason why I believe that we must look at topological metals for interconnect application is that about a quarter of all known materials are predicted to be topological. That means we have a vast selection of topological systems for interconnect applications, as well as the memory devices that Jiang Ping just talk, uh, talked about in terms of spin-based uh, devices. Next, please. So I'm part of um, NCOR, SRC NCOR Impact Center with the lead University of Stanford. And my task is looking at uh, liner-free, non-oxide-based topological metals for potential low resistance interconnects. Next, please. So we first looked at uh, topological metals, known topological metals and their bulk properties. So we want high carrier density and low resistivity. So among the topological metals that we screen, molybdenum phosphide seemed really promising because it has a high carrier density comparable to copper. And its resistivity for bulk crystal is eight microm centimeter, about four times higher than copper. Next, please. So in this um, NPEG uh, center, we've been making molybdenum phosphide nanowires. And you can see these are polycrystalline nanowires with the grain size of about 20 to 25 nanometers. Uh, next, please. And we're measuring the resistivity as a function of the diameter of these nanowires. And you can see that the resistivity is pretty stable as we are decreasing the size of these nanowires. And it does not increase at the rate the copper increases, for example. Next slide. So here's then comparison of our smallest molybdenum phosphide nanowires compared to the copper wires with the tannyl nitride barrier. Uh, this copper data comes from a paper from four years ago. So this is not the latest copper data comparison. But you can see that the molybdenum phosphide have lower resistivity than copper with a barrier layer below 25 nanometer in diameter. And this attractive geometric scaling is better seen uh, when we look at the line resistance. Next, please. So here is the line resistance as a function of diameter or cross sections comparing the molybdenum phosphide nanowire uh, devices. Again, these are polycrystalline wires with about 25 nanometers grain size. And comparing that to the line resistance increase of copper, uh, or barrierless ruthenium. So you can see that eventually molybdenum phosphide nanowires would outperform uh, copper or ruthenium. Next, please. Um, so what are the challenges? So first, I believe that topological metals could really be the solution to the interconnect challenges because the resistivity is predicted to decrease as you shrink the dimensions. The challenges of using topological materials for interconnect problem, interconnect uh, applications as well as spin devices is how do we screen all these promising topological systems in a high throughput manner and accurately, right? And we want to harness these topological properties at room temperature or even at slightly elevated temperatures and how does the physics work? And lastly, once we identify topological systems that are suitable for applications, the processes have to be uh, back end of line compatible, at least for interconnect applications. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. And that was a nice uh, introduction to topological materials for, for interconnects. Um, uh, while while we uh, just finish up with you, maybe we can uh, have one question before we get into uh, all of uh, the rest of the questions for the panel. 
Um, uh, I'd like to understand, uh, since most of these materials uh, have cop uh, that are being considered with topological properties, uh, uh, rely on surface states for conduction uh, for this application. Uh, do these materials provide the current density that's um, that's similar to bulk materials, since uh, these are mainly surface states we're talking about? So I will answer that question. That, so for particularly for molybdenum phosphide, the carrier density is really high. It's 10 to the 23. And most of the good resistivity we see, we think is coming from the bulk property. Now, if you want materials that really maximizes the topological surface states, uh, then the carrier density may not be high because so it's a two things. So for example, um, some of the compound that is topological was cobalt silicide. Cobalt silicide has been shown to have decreasing resistivity as you shrink it. However, the carrier density is sitting around 10 to the 18. So you, you may not have enough current density. Um, so I think it depends on what are some applications that you're thinking about. I will note there are topological metals with high carrier densities. But then now you ask, well, then is, it a, is the property we like due to bulk effects or topological surface effects, right? Exactly. How do we make sure that we're getting a bulk effect and not just some sort of uh, you know, near surface effect and, and uh, that we have the same number of carriers throughout the material? Uh, it could also help that if your bulk properties are really good as you shrink it, your topological surface states are there to suppress the surface scattering. Which is also good. <laughs> yeah. And I guess uh, that would come down to uh, what, what our understanding of that is. And, and maybe uh, uh, Blanca has looked at that uh, for, for, for some sort of uh, modeling. Uh, our panel is on mute, so I think it's time to open it up. Uh, Blanca, do you want to uh, comment on any any uh, types of modeling that have gone gone toward uh, looking at reduction of scattering uh, using these type of materials? Yeah, yeah. Actually, there is a there are a bunch of efforts going on um, in multiple groups um, as well, trying to characterize surface scattering for specifically interconnect and interfacial effect. Um, well, now from the modeling perspective, you, you can do it at multiple levels. And even on the atomistic side, there are some challenges that uh, needs to be addressed specifically for these very exotic materials uh, to, get them, uh, to get them characterized correctly. Uh, the, luckily, there are uh, many, many uh, breakthroughs coming up um, in, um, in the um, general physics, chemistry, and um, material science community of developing methodologies to handle exactly the, the problems associated with uh, electron correlations and um, non-local effects. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think you know these are exactly the systems to um, to be modeled and um, figured out how to be modeled correctly. But approximation needs to be used and um, whether what like, what level that needs to be uh, addressed um, as we go, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, we can go right into uh, some of the questions that we had developed for the, uh, for the panel uh, regarding uh, computational material science. Um, and you touched upon them to some extent saying that there might be some new tools on the horizon. Um, we definitely have a, have problems bridging the gaps between material scales, you know, when our, we go from atomistic uh, to, to uh, higher orders uh, is really kind of a gap. Um, and there's also a gap in the, the, the leg scales that individual um, types of calculations are geared toward in that uh, a lot of times they don't actually give the right answer. So when we talk about correlated materials and, and we know that uh, band gaps in, in correlated materials are very hard to predict. Um, maybe you can comment on some of the new tools that are coming and also the new tools uh, that might be on the horizon uh, for, for bridging the gaps. Yeah, so so I would say these are probably two parts of the question because um, you know the the problems with band gaps and so on they are usually traceable back to the approximations we 
routinely use, let's say, within the domestic approaches, which are semi-local. Yeah. So on that side, um, for the correlations and uh, to improve the overall uh, electron um, interaction description, there are ways we can already do and had been around for, for a couple of years. The only issue is that it takes a long time to use them. Uh, because you need to go to hybrid. So it, it relates to exchange correlation part to be more exact. And there you can use hybrid for functionals or you can use quasi-particle uh, approximations. And they are shown to work. Um, it only that one needs to have the time and the expertise to use them. And so what I see here uh, moving forward is some uh, cross-disciplinary interactions between the different groups, training of the students or um, with this kind of background could help push these models to become more mainstream. And so um, that's where the band gap for the, um, you know, transition, metal insulated transition aspect to topological um, aspect and so on. And for bridging between the different layers, um, that's actually a different kind of problem because we need to figure out how to parse the parameters from one level to another. How we go from a microscopic description where we look one uh, atom diffusing to, between two sides to a more macroscopic uh, effect where multiple phenomena can happen at the same time. And uh, as well as there are some rare events and so on. So along that line, very excitingly, recently there, there's a, a lot of uh, effort to bridging towards molecular dynamics uh, side of it through machine learning techniques, for example. So nowadays, um, actually many of the scientific codes available in the literature can do some sort of machine learning on the fly uh, based on the accuracy of, of atomistic quantum mechanical simulation and parse them into larger scale, like molecular dynamics that can do tens of thousands of atoms now. So addressing the larger scale uh, while still, uh, you know, preserving the accuracy of the quantum mechanical side. So it's, it's very interesting. This, this, is, this is just building up as we speak. Uh, and it's going to be extended and moved on to the next step. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like as a group, we might uh, certainly consider uh, ways in which we can uh, leverage uh, resources like from, from NIST and from the NSF uh, to create infrastructure so that we can uh, you know, tackle some of the problems that's, that we know are, are present and uh, utilize the, the emergence uh, literature so that we can uh, take advantage of that in a, in, a, in a quick manner because a lot of this uh, really goes toward the ability to to uh, work at uh, ultra scale dimensions that, that are necessary. And uh, I guess once we're, now that we're talking about ultra scale, maybe um, we can uh, talk about um, issues with uh, 2D materials. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a Nobel prize awarded uh, for research done back in 2007. So now it looks like we're about 15 years into 2D materials and we really don't have an implementation in large scale manufacturing for, for electronics anyway. Maybe uh, York can comment on uh, what we need to do to get there. Thank you very much for the question, Steve. Um, as I said, I think we are getting there. 15 years is actually not that long of a time frame when you're looking at many of the other technologies that made it to the market. But, but it's absolutely true that many of the demonstrations have been occurring at the um, chiplet level. Although now you see more and more when it comes to two-dimensional material growth, eight-inch wafer growth within the United States, we have groups abroad in Europe, uh, eight-inch wafer growth has been done successfully. And also uh, on top of that, heterogeneous systems have been built. And so I think we need to just build an alliance now that really looks at things at that scale in order to make sure that we are bridging this valley of death that we have in front of us. Uh, actually, it's more often abyss in the case of the microelectronics, I would say, because it's so hard to find an entrance point. But all the pointers are in place to make this work. And um, if you're looking at some projections, for example, from IMAC, um, they believe strongly in, and I'm just citing here, that in 2040, there may be an entrance point for two-dimensional materials to even enter into the logic realm, which is much harder than, for example, the memory and the interconnect applications that I mentioned to you before. All right, does anybody else have any comments on, on what we need to do to make uh, 
uh, 2D type materials and it could even go towards uh, magnetic materials and uh, ALD uh, uh, a reality. All right, no comment from our panelists there. Uh, <laughs> well, what I think, uh, just from, from my standpoint, I'd really like to understand what uh, introduction of uh, defects uh, individually have an effect um, from a modeling standpoint and from a reality standpoint uh, for these 2D materials. So that would uh, go toward uh, tying the loop between modelers and experimentalists. What, what do you think we can do to uh, uh, accelerate our ability to tie those two back together. Maybe I can make a quick comment here, uh, Steve, because you just talked about defects. In the field, often I hear people saying the bottleneck is really the quality of the TMD materials, but that's actually not really true. Uh, the problem is the control of the interfaces, because it's not just the defects of the TMDs, it's a full understanding of that stack, including the gate dielectric, the source drain metals that needs to be explored. And so I, I would love to see that when simulation efforts are looking to this, that we are not just looking at the bare material, but the boundary conditions, the interfaces play a key role. And I think Blanca mentioned that. And so our research has to focus on interfaces, interface studies at scale. Blanca? Yes. Uh, yes, definitely. So contact issues for 2D materials are, are, are very critical. And the way we model them uh, to address them in a more realistic way. So um, there have been a lot of studies, as, as um, you might be aware, where, where more ideal interfaces have been studied. So right now, at the point where, where really we are looking at the defects in an in interfacial region, to look at the diffusion part um, of those defects, but both sides of the interface, but also having the contacts um, modeled properly. Yes, I agree. The, the interfacial directions are, are the most critical by moving forward. But we have models, so that's the good news. <laughs> we just have to apply them and we have to figure out a way to apply them and get them um, to work faster. So. Uh, yeah, and we have a question from the audience that uh, goes toward uh, interfaces. Uh, they're wondering about, uh, uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny. I think they meant interfacial, but they said interracial. But um, <laughs> the, uh, what are the possibilities of uh, interfacial phase change memory? Um, maybe they're speaking of uh, nanolaminates, but um, if there's anybody that has uh, ideas or comments on this, I know that Jorg works on uh, 2D um, uh, phase change types of uh, systems, so maybe, maybe he has an idea. Yeah, so I, I, want, I didn't have the time, of course, to, to work this out, but uh, what we observed is uh, different from normal phase change memories, right, where you have some heating occurring, you have some transition between an amorphous and a crystalline phase, which is often hard to control, requires some fine tuning of the amplitudes and voltages. What we observed is that we can create a small distortion in a crystalline layered two-dimensional MOT2 film applying a field in the perpendicular direction, small distortion. We mapped this out nicely with the help from this wonderful collaboration that showed really how these new atoms are now aligned. And this is an effect that is reversible. We can go back to the 2H phase, which is the semiconducting phase, and back to the uh, distorted phase. And this crystalline change, picture just atoms making little changes, is very, very fast. And that is where I see opportunities that you normally don't have because you don't have just interfaces in the 3D world. Yeah, and, and sort of a follow up that uh, might go toward uh, NIST. How, how do, since we are very concerned about the modeling and dealing with these uh, interfaces, how, how can we uh, uh, leverage um, what we know about metrology and uh, roadmaps uh, for actually looking at uh, interfaces with, with atomic level precision? That, 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 that's a great question, Steve. Um, I, I think moving forward, um, you know, certainly as we introduce more, more types of materials, device designs, et cetera, there, there has to be a, a, a strong engagement with, with industry to make sure that we're defining the requirements, the metrics, et cetera, in the appropriate way. And closing that loop with 
with academia because they're best positioned to actually inform us on that early knowledge, as well as the metrology needs around um, that information that's needed, as opposed to metrology around manufacturing per se. So certainly there's tremendous challenges in trying to understand, you know, we've, we've mapped the band gap of silicon quite well. And we, we know what different um, defects there can do, what their role is, whether they're a trap or a dopant, for example. <laughs> um, and and um, chemical interfaces like mm -hmm. SISO2 are, are, are well studied and, and characterized. Um, but in these new systems where we have saturated interface bonds, like in 2D materials, we can th think of graphene, carbon nanotubes even. And then we introduce a, 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 a dielectric on top of that that doesn't necessarily form the same type of, of, um, of interface chemical bond that we're comfortable with in silicon, silicon dioxide. We really have to think about what are we studying? What are we studying? Are we studying um, scattering centers? Are we studying traps? Are we studying, is it in the 2D material itself? Is it in the dielectric interface? Um, how does it contribute to reliability, um, noise, et cetera? And the same extends all the way out to contacts. And I would say that, that we have some, some handle on some conventional metrology that can be adapted into this space. But I would say that, that we're at a very exciting time with regard to roadmaps and metrology in that there's this opportunity to, to really rethink how we've done things in the past, if it's appropriate, and if there are innovations there that are needed. Yeah, are there maybe you can comment on one or two specifics for metrology that uh, could be adapted, or if there are some some new techniques on the horizon that uh, maybe maybe we should pay attention to? Um, I, I think York pointed to some of them. Um, how do we do innovations in transmission electron microscopy, for example, to understand are these you know is this flat land electronics these layered structures are they really as flat as we as we believe them to be? Um, we can think about um, what are we forming as far as new materials if we walk down the path of trying to do a doping versus an alloying to form contacts. We can think about metrology around um, thermalization and nanoscale heat transport in, in, in presumably the drain end of the device. Um, certainly, what are the ultimates and scaling limits? Um, maybe I can't aggressively scale the dimensions of my contacts because I need to have a minimum transfer length or, 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 or region to, to absorb that, that excess energy. Um, and, and I think that there's lots of um, interesting work out there trying to develop the measurements to understand this. Do, do, you, do you see it the same way, Jorg? Yeah, me, me, thank you very much uh, for the answer, Dave. I think what you said is perfectly right. I would add to this uh, in my wish list. Can we have one of those high resolution STM images that we can bias in situ and we can actually see the motion of the atoms. We can see how things dynamically change at that atomic scale, right? That is a meteorology that I would be very excited to, to have available. And I think it becomes increasingly important when we are talking about these nanostructures. So maybe add to that. So these in situ TM experiments, I mean, those are have, those have been done on select systems, and I did one with IBM on their PCM devices, not Model B devices, but industry um, process real PCM devices, and have seen those things. I would say that that requires a lot of um, education and dedication. So we want to think about really educating specialized students that really specialize in these techniques and then make sure that that's continued, right? That it's not just a one-off project, spent three years, do it, learned a lot, and then sort of the student moves on and then we lose that ability. Okay, I can add on top of this. Actually, uh, I, I didn't get a chance to talk about that. Through the smart center, you know, this one of the three anchor center, and uh, we developed, basically my colleague, Professor Andrew McKayat, developed exactly what uh, Yog just talked about here, so-called in situ 
measurement of the device at the same time look at atomic imaging, you know, this uh, interface. And then we had a result look at MTG, basically that the first result based on MTG, because MTG is mostly difficult part. You have to have the two terminal device, you have to the FIB card through and then pass the current STT switching, right? Then pass current through and let's see what happening exactly at the interface in situ. And then Professor Mankaya really did a great job. So this paper is still not pu officially published, but upload to SRC and call, you know, this uh, uh, Smart Center website. I think we can share with all the colleagues across all SRC uh, uh, community. I think we've been support, uh, suggested by sponsor also fire patent. And I think uh, we did that, yeah. So now maybe open to all the people can, SRC community look into that. That's very exciting. It took almost three years. Andrew, and I also follow what uh, Judy's comment is true. So there's one post, uh, his, her name is uh, Huang, Huang Hui Yong. And then, yeah, she dedicated on this and uh, hope we can keep her, <laughs> keep working on those projects rather than this uh, center close. And then, you know, she had to shift it to other projects. Yeah, this is very good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, you I should check out that. Yeah, David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Jean Ping. Uh, we'll uh, look to the Smart Center, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably on the SRC site. So if our uh, member company uh, participants here uh, want to, they can go look it up on the SRC site. Maybe you can uh, comment on what the title of the paper is. Yeah. Yeah. I will do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And uh, I think we'll do a little uh, wrap up. Well, first, I want to thank all of our uh, panelists and our uh, speakers today in uh, keeping to the time and really uh, making this thought pro provoking. Um, I think uh, the, the amount of information that came up in this uh, short hours, hours plus time is enough to uh, fill up a whole week of discussions. But uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be able to uh, use this as a stepping stone uh, for those types of uh, interactions going forward. And uh, many of you will be working on uh, the new, the new uh, jump program that's, that's coming out. Um, and we will look to ways to incorporate um, more of you. Um, maybe we can get some closing comments from, uh, from Victor and or Eric. You guys are on mute, so if uh, you have... Uh... Uh... Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, the keynote, the panelists, the moderator, uh, the intra, intra talk, everything was great. And thank you, the audience, for the audience has been very engaged and uh, asked a lot of questions in the QA. QA window. Thank you, it was a great event, and I look forward to the future. And I, and, yeah, and I do as well. And uh, you know, we are, most of us are listed on the SRC site. If you'd like to uh, uh, follow up with us in any way that uh, you can look to there to, to gain our uh, uh, contacts. And we look forward to uh, more of these type of interactions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye.